Well, it's lovely to be here at the best name conference I think I've ever been to. <laughs> uh, it's been really lovely so far. Yes, so um, I'd like to talk about a few things close to my heart. Um, I'm an electronic musician and I also have a background in engineering and robotics. And this is sort of uniting some of those ideas, but from the archives. So if you want to talk about the origins of today's music, it depends how far back you want to go. And the received wisdom, for example, is that the recording age began with the Edison phonograph, 1877, the first machine to record and play back sounds. But actually, we've been recording for centuries before that, not using machines, but birds. So, um, wonderful story. Here, here's a painting by Chardin um, in the 18th century. And uh, this woman is playing a tune to her caged birds. And she's playing it on this machine here, a serenette, a little portative organ that made little high-pitched, birdie-pitched sounds. And it could play all the fashionable tunes of the day, a gavotte or a minuet or whatever. And she could equally have been doing that on a little flute or a flageolet. And uh, what she'd do, Every day, she'd, every morning, she'd take the cover off the bird, play the tune, and give the bird some kind of juicy worm or whatever. And then when her friends came round, instead of putting on the stereo, she'd take the cover off, and the bird would sing the tune. And this persisted until the phonograph got into people's homes. This was still being done in the late 19th century. Um, and of course, rather than going and buying your CDs or your downloads, um, you could choose to buy fashionable melodies in these bird training books, which were where the songs were actually pitched for the bird in question. These were called the Bird Fancier's Delights. So I love that. There's an example of a hugely, hugely, uh, before the electric age, uh, uh, sort of um, anti, you know, ancestor of what we do now. And of course, the word record actually comes from bird training, because birds are said to record when they've learned to memorise and play back their song. You couldn't, actually you could buy pre-recorded birds. Actually, yes, you could in the markets. And they, and they had a premium, as did particular types of birds. And, and of course, the one that everybody wanted was the nightingale, because it had a beautiful song, but it's very hard to look after because um, it, it, it needed soft, live food. And there was a big, big deal trying to make a bird that had the ruggedness of a canary with the sort of song power of a uh, nightingale. So it's a bit like one of these sort of, you know, classic engineering problems, and, and they never quite got there. Anyway, but then thankfully Edison came along. Um, yes, and um, it's wonderful when you find all these strange little examples of attributes of what we think are like today's powerful, you know, amplified music appearing in the pre-electric age. I mean, great big bass speaker stacks with visceral trouser flapping bass. Um, they're a descendant of what goes on in cathedrals. It's been going on in, cathed in cathedrals since the time of Bach, maybe earlier. Now this is Atlantic City Hall. These men are at the bottom of the bass organ pipe, the lowest one, which is 64 feet long. It makes sound at eight hertz. Now I, I wouldn't even call that sound, I'd call that infrasound. It sounds so deep it's on the cusp of perception and you feel it rather than hear it. And, and people went to get the wow factor in the same way that they'll go to a sun concert now and get the wow factor. And it was what created the sense of awe. And so I love that. I love that again. Um, technology uh, in the pre-electric age, sort of pre-echo of what we do now. Uh, the person I showed earlier um, is a hero of mine, Daphne Oram. And here she is. Uh, she was the co-founder of the Radiophonic Workshop, among many other things. Brilliant composer. And here she is with her Aramics machine, which was a sort of optical synthesizer come sequencer, which, which she invented. And um, there are many reasons why Daphne's a hero, but it hasn't escaped my notice that people like Oram and Delia Derbyshire stand out from the crowd because, of course, they were female. And the sort of received wisdom is that uh, somehow women had only a marginal role in the history of electronic music and the history of dance music. Um, that we have today. And again, you could say, well, why is that? And you could, same thing again, depends how far back you want to go. I would go back to St. Paul, who said these terrible words. Um, that means, uh, Mulier, Tassiat, in Ecclesia. Does anybody want to translate that? 
uh, women be silent in church. So in the, um, and this is where it all started, basically. Uh, um, women were sort of pushed out of making noises, um, musical noises in church, because it was considered um, undignified in some way and might sort of, you know, rough t ruffle too many feathers. So women were prevented from an early, early time, and this persisted way, way into the sort of 19th century, from making as much musical expression as men. But even then, some wonderful things happened um, because, um, and I think this is about being a cyborg, this. I think that what I'm about to tell you is about how people embrace cyborg technology to well, break down these awful gender um, binaries. And of course, that was the invention, and I use the word advisedly, invention, of the castrato. So the castrato was a male voice that could be used in church and in other public places, but the, the, the man in question was castrated so this is the technology of the time, the surgeon's knife, was castrated um, around puberty and developed into this strange sort of big body type with incredibly wide vocal range, massive soprano range as well as sort of lower range. And these were cyborgs. They were a combination of human and technology. And I don't think you could say they were necessarily male or female when you think about them musically. Their voice was something other and it was something transcendent and, you know, cruel as it was, it was meant to be a, an absolutely exquisite sound. And I love that story. And um, so I'm always interested in stories that subvert some of the ideas that are in circulation about ma men, women and music technology. And also stories where um, electrical music has pre-electric origins. And this is one of my favourites and uh, it sort of unites them all. And I didn't know quite where to start, but usually when I tell this story, and I'm going to do it today because I think you'll like some of the pictures, um, I'm going to start with this. And it was in the November 1960 edition of Popular Mechanics magazine. <coughs> and it was the Sideman, essentially the world's first commercial drum machine. And uh, as you can see, what you do is you sort of play like this as you're an organ player, and then you can turn to the side and use your sideman to get your drums on. But actually, a sideman was a general term in use for sort of session musicians who'd come in and supply a sound really quickly. Um, it's a wonderful machine. It's electromechanical. This is what you get on the top, all your different rhythms, your tango, your cha-cha-cha and all that. And this is what it looks like under the lid. So obviously you've got your speaker here, um, the amps. This is the important bit, the rotor selector. And the rotor selector relates to this wonderful piece of kit here, which was the wheel. So what would happen? Oh, there we are, the wheel. So what would happen is um, there are brushes on here that would make contact with these and the rotor would switch different brushes on and off and it would just sweep round and click and pop, you know, do sort of little resonant uh, type sounds as well as sort of noise clicks. And, um, and then you could just change the speed of an idle, um, use an idler wheel to change the speed of the rotor and that's how you got your different speeds. And, you know, and it was sold as this thing that enabled anybody to have a full rhythm section at your side, which, of course, it did, which was a great thing if you were a keyboard player because you no longer needed to rely on a drummer and you no longer needed to split the fee with a drummer. But it was a terrible thing for drummers, obviously. So, <laughs> so they went on the attack and they got some very important people working with them, uh, none more important than the UK Musicians' Union, who did something very clever. They pointed out the obvious weakness in this sideman, which was that it was perfect. It produced absolutely perfectly metric beats. It didn't have any of the sort of rubato, any of the sort of rhythmic ebb and flow of a human drummer. And they called it a robot, a stilted machine. And they said, don't fall for it. They didn't think it was any good. They said it could only compete with the most basic drummer but um, it, it meant that the most sort of the rookie drummer couldn't even learn their craft and become a sort of wonderful drummer. This is what it sounded like. And um, yeah, the um, drum machine wasn't the Musicians' Union first run in uh, with sound technology. Um, that could replace musicians, not by any means. And another classic example, of course, was what they called the talky menace, um, sound in the cinema. And uh, this is a beautiful example from 1930. You know, sound film had been around for a while then. And what it shows on the front of the Musicians' Union magazine 
is a cinema returning to sanity because the dehumanised music, as they call it, the canned music's been put in the bin, and they're bringing in the flesh and blood orchestra. And that's what they did. They, they kind of said, well, these machines are clearly inferior because they're not flesh and blood. And it was not time for the Musicians' Union when these things happened because they'd always considered themselves rather unlike other artisans. But suddenly, because they were creating an artistic product and somehow they had felt, they, they spoke about feeling that they, they couldn't just be replaced by machines, and all of a sudden they were. Because, of course, they were like artisans in other industries when things like film sound, um, sound recording, and the drum machine came in, because suddenly their labour could be replicated um, by machines, and all they had to do was get somebody to tend those machines. And, of course, in the Industrial Revolution, this was something that was sort of gathering pace and was happening more and more. And, of course, with automation, as people were trying to find more and more efficient ways, if you like, to make stuff, it's sort of, you know, the tailorization of the workplace, work became atomized, and sort of skilled jobs disappeared, and uh, people started to basically be just tending the machines, almost like becoming robots, automaton, automata, just sort of tending these mighty engines of mass production. And of course, there's a whole big story there. But relevant to my story is this. Uh, this is the work of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. Some of you may have seen these. I'd love to build one of these, actually. This is their chronocyclograph. So what they've done is somebody here, I think she's making buttons or some such thing. And um, what they do is they have flashing lights on the wrists and then they do a long exposure and then and what they were trying to do was they were trying to make humans into machine ideals so this was around 1910 and what they were trying to do was iron out all these kinks that a machine wouldn't make all the stuff they called wasted motion because they were trying to get people more happiness minutes and obviously get them more efficient on the production line and of course today Automation is everywhere, isn't it? And to the point where when we actually see hand, handmade stuff, we put it in our couture houses, in our museums, you know, we charge extra for it. And similarly, I'd argue that we live in the era of transmitted music, as everybody says. For many people, hearing live music is the exception to the norm now. And for many musicians, myself included, sometimes it's quite hard to know how to render something live when we're used to sort of presenting it in this sort of transmitted, duplicated form. And just like that drummer, just like the drummer could distinguish themselves from the drum machine with the sort of kinks in rhythm, it's these kind of kinks, isn't it, that we look for when we buy things to sort of reassure us that there's been some sort of human agency at work. And, and I, I find all this sort of stuff fascinating as a musician because I think, well, what am I? Am I the factory owner, you know, buying all this kit that I can get my hands on to, to make music, or am I the artisan? I think I'm sort of somewhere between the two, as are many of my friends. But um, a few years back, I was talking about this to a friend in the kitchen of my house. My friend Caroline is a performer and a theatre historian. And she's a clog dancer. And she said, uh, well, yeah, she said, w would you like to work with me? All this stuff you've been saying, it's really relevant. Would you like to work with me on a new theatre piece? I said, oh, yes. And she said, yeah, it's, uh, it's clog dancing. <laughs> And um, I wasn't quite sure what to make of this, because this, <laughs> this is my sort of memory of clog dancing, the sort of pastoral thing that used to happen after Morris Men on a Sunday afternoon. And it, it's perfectly nice, but it's just not... Doesn't, I can't sort of relate to it particularly as sort of urbanite, interested in machines and all of this. But then Caroline stood up and showed me the clog dance that she was interested in me working in, and it was absolutely astounding. Because what she did, she stood in the kitchen and... She made her body completely still, so like no wasted motion, completely machine-like. And she started to do the opening steps of this traditional dance. And this is what it looked like.
And so what that was, that was the opening steps of a dance called The Machinery, an absolutely astounding dance. Um, this is what Caroline told me. As you all know, clogs were the working shoes of people in the mills. And The Machinery was a dance that evolved in the mill itself. It was devised by the women working in these incredibly cramped conditions in the mill. And what they were doing is that they were closely mimicking the actions and the sounds of the machines themselves. And this was in 1824, the earliest known uh, record of the machinery, this dance. And it's been passed down, passed down, passed down through the mill workers and then through somebody called Pat Tracy, who sadly now died. She was like the, the last in the line. And it's machine music from the steam powered age. And um, obviously in the mill, so what we did, just to cut a long story short, I said, this is great, let's go to a mill. We went to Quarry Bank Mill on the Cheshire-Lancashire border and we made close-up sound recordings and visual recordings of all the machines. And every one of these machines, like the governor and the mule, have associated steps. And I thought, let's get rid of the accordions, let's get rid of this sort of pastoral stuff, let's put the machine, the, 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 the dance back in context with the record of the machines themselves. And ultimately, we want to perform it in the mill itself. And um, it was an astounding visit to Quarry Bank because um, we got to see the machines that these women worked in. And when we were there, they could only run a small percentage of them for health and safety reasons. But even that was incredible. The sort of sheer noise and the sort of metric quality of the sound. I mean, here, here, here's just a few of them layered up. So if you imagine, that was like a tiny percentage of the machines they could run, and these were running all day long. These women couldn't move, they couldn't lose pace with the machine, or they'd lose their jobs, or worse. All they, could, they couldn't speak to one another, all they could do was stamp their feet, and that was their form of expression. And it was a highly virtuosic thing, it became very competitive. The women sort of vied to be the person that could do the closest mimic of all the different bits of the machine, the shunts and the bloom and the mule and all of this. And um, then they took it to the free and easies. They actually took it outside their workplace and took it to these places called the free and easies where they'd show off a bit like wrestlers would wrestle for belts. They would do the machinery for belts. I mean, I, I, I just find this dance astounding. You know, these women, this is the view out of the window of the mill, these women could have tried to find some kind of escape. But what they were actually doing was they were coalescing with the very machines that they were slave to. And um, I found that fascinating on so many levels because I was thinking about everything that the Musicians' Union had said about dehumanisation and everything we think about today. And it was... Um, it just felt completely ahead of its time in a way that um, I still find astounding. And of course, the, it also felt very familiar. As somebody who's into electronic music culture, it felt very familiar. Obviously, it was Gilbrithian. There was no wasted motion. But of course, there were some other sort of familiar things in there that put me in mind of stuff like this. And I always think this is very Gilbrithian, by the way. <laughs> So there you go, there is uh, the women in the cotton mills beating craft work to sort of dehumanised robotic dancing by about 150 years. 
And so going back to my sideman, anyway, because I think it's all related, you see, because, of course, the sideman, yes, it did dehumanise drumming. It turned it into this automaton, which I think the women would have found very interesting. But, of course, it was embraced rather like the film sound. It was embraced not because it was a copy, but because it was an interesting something other. And particularly when more compact machines, like the famous TR-808, came along, which were beloved of the early um, t um, electro and techno generation. And, of course... Where was one of the wellsprings of that? Once again in the factory. Here is um, a picture of a Detroit factory, a modern one. This is obviously probably itself now gone, but this is a, this is a factory using um, uh, robots. But of course, 50, 60 years ago, it was a factory, a production line of people. I mean, Detroit automation, automation was born. The production line of this kind was born in, in Detroit. And what came out of that? Well, once again, musicians couldn't help coalescing with the machines around them and creating music that reflected their environment. I mean, if you listen to early uh, techno, things like Cybertron. Cybertron sounds like the factory, and it sounds like it's talking about the cars of the factory. So I definitely see an affinity there between the Detroit techno people and the Lancashire Mill techno women. And uh, where the women had the free and easies, they had things like the JIT, all these dances that were like competitive dances where, you know, you wanted to be the sort of top gang or whatever who had the best moves. And, you know, this could have been happening in a free and easy, this sort of thing. So there we are, it's happened twice, hasn't it? We've had people working in sort of factory conditions where they've been almost subsumed by the machines around them and they've created something wonderful that's coalescing with and embracing their... coalescing with the machines and embracing their dehumanisation. And so I keep wondering, is it happening anywhere else? And there's a beautiful example. Um, is it Rob Lysett, who was here earlier? I'm not very good on names. He just told me a brilliant example where on a Saturday night in... Um, Oh, it was a, it was a, I have to get him to write this down. It was a department store in Birmingham. Every Saturday night, all the till rolls would be emptied and they all used to create this wonderful sort of phasing, dancey effect. And all the women on the tills used to get up and dance. And it was like this ritual they did every Saturday night because obviously they all sort of demob happy and they danced to the very tills they've been listening to all day long. And so I wondered if it's been happening, for example, in the call centres, which of course have been described as the dark satanic mills of our time as every moment of your time tends to be monitored. Interestingly, I just want to say about the call centres, some very spooky associations between call centres life and the mill life, because of course, as I'm sure many of you know around here, many of the call centres have opened in sites of former mills. And if you think about the history of the cotton mills and the cotton trade, uh, at the early you know, turn of the 20th century, um, the big network of the time was, of course, the shipping network and the container ship network later on. And that was exploited to send the cotton trade out of the country to other countries. And what we've got now, we've got the big network of the time, the internet. And similarly, the call centres are sort of moving outside the country. And I think it's very, very interesting the way um, communications technology has sort of created the same transition twice. So and I hope you find that interesting. I mean, I'm fascinated by... Th this dance that was, it, it kind of felt like an act of defiance, but at the same time, an act of sort of uh, coalescence, as I say, with the machines. And I hope you'd agree that not only is somebody like um, uh, Daphne Oram um, a pioneer, but of course, she shouldn't be alone. And perhaps these women also deserve a place. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>